Data Skeptic is the official podcast of dataskeptic.com, bringing you stories, interviews, and mini episodes on topics in data science, machine learning, statistics, and artificial intelligence. All right, Linda, so today we're going to talk about Bayesian networks. So a Bayesian network is a probabilistic, acyclic directed graph. I don't know what that means. All right, so let's get into it. Start with graph. Graph, it's a chart, a visual representation of data. That's normally a good answer. A lot of people think that way. I'm using it in like the data structure way. So graph, like a graph of the internet, all of the nodes are websites and the edges are links between them, like a social network. That's a graph? Yeah, we call that a graph. Listen, so what is your definition of a graph? A graph is a collection of nodes and edges. And an edge is, is it a visual? Link. It can be. I mean, you definitely visualize them, but you can just do it on paper, too, if you want to. So you could just have coordinates? There is no position. You just talk, relatively speaking. There's something called an adjacency matrix that just indicates if two edges have a link between them or not. So it could be a chart that says link, yes or no. Yeah, yeah. And that's a graph. Yeah, so like somewhere at Facebook, there's probably a database table that says like friend one, friend two, and those are just the links, you know, like Kyle, Linda, friend. Okay. So that's a graph. Now, a directed acyclic graph means that the edges between it don't form a cycle. So they always go in one direction, kind of like a tree. You know, a tree branches out. The tree's limbs never connect back to its roots. We don't know how peanuts grow, so... Why? What's wrong with peanuts? Peanut... You know... (laughs) I learned this in elementary school. They taught me about this peanut plant. So it grows upward, Uh but then it puts the pods under the ground. So it goes up and then goes... That sounds like an urban legend. No, I'm pretty sure it's a diagram if my third grade memory serves me right. (laughs) Well, all right. We'll have to look that one up. Lastly, it's probabilistic in that in a Bayesian network is a special kind of use case of a graph. So keeping in mind that a, a graph is kind of like a social network... But in our case, a Bayesian network, the nodes are not people, they're ideas, they're random variables. A random variable, if it was a problem about a car, could be like how long ago you got an oil changed, whether or not it has a flat tire, just any sort of detail you would have. Another node could be like, is the check engine light on? Now, there's many things that can turn the check engine light on, right? Oh, yeah, at least with uh, Toyotas. Yeah, especially our car. I don't think we've ever had it off, really, for a very extended period of time. Yep. I'm just used to that false alarm right there. That's what we call a type 2 error. Just because it's on doesn't tell us necessarily what the problem is. Yep, it just says check engine. Although it's probably independent of whether or not we have a flat tire, right? They have another light for a flat tire. If we were drawing a Bayesian network of the car, there'd be a node for, you know, is the tire flat or not? And there'd be a node for the check engine light. And they wouldn't directly link because the flat tire would not cause the check engine light to go on. But the random variable of how much oil you have in the car, that would be linked to the check engine light. Because if it gets low, there's some probability it'll turn the light on. A node like uh, whether or not the check engine light goes on, it has a bunch of incoming links from other nodes. And then there's something inside of it called a conditional probability table. And it describes the likelihood of the state of that node based on all of the inputs. So in the case of, let's say, this check engine light, if the input is the level of oil, if the reading is full, then there's a very, there should be a low likelihood the light is on. If the level of oil is very low, there should be a high probability that the light is on, right? Uh, yeah, assuming the light works. Right. Yeah. The accuracy of the system, how well-tuned of a metrology device it is, that's going to be captured in this conditional probability table. So we say, what are the probabilities that this variable will be in these different states or have these different values? given the input it has, which you may or may not know, right? Mm -hmm. But you can describe what you know about those other nodes probabilistically. So you can say like, well, I think these things might be true. And then the whole Bayesian network, the reason it's Bayesian is because it updates all of the beliefs you have over those different random values. Like, can you give an example? Let's put a Bayesian network in the context of like a a medical application, like in a doctor's office or something like that. Hypothetically, you go in complaining of fever. The doctor in their mind, or maybe they have a piece of software that actually does this, has all of these things they can measure about you, your blood pressure, your temperature, any complaints you have, the amount of pain you report to be in, these sorts of things. And then they have some nodes, some random variables that represent that, like what it could be caused by. So for example... 
if you report like feeling dizzy, well, that could be related to blood pressure or it could be related to, I don't know, probably two or three other things. And all those things could be related to you having a certain syndrome or disease or virus or something like that. Okay. There's things that cause other things and you can narrow them down based on symptoms. Yep. And you know the relationship between them. So for example, if I go in complaining that I have a headache the doctor's probably not going to x-ray my my bones to see if I have a broken bone, right? Well, you're saying they would rule something out, yes. So the doctor has a belief over your medical state, and and you can express that belief in the Bayesian network as a belief over the value of every node. How about the belief you have malaria? Do you think if uh, if you went to the doctor complaining of a fever, would the doctor assume that you have malaria? Well, assuming you live in the U.S. and... That's where you hang out with most of your time, right? Then they'd probably not look towards malaria, but they would ask some questions. So they would ask, Do you travel? Malaria is present in tropical countries and climates where mosquitoes breed a lot more. So the doctor begins with this maybe low probability that you have malaria. And then you report, hey, I've been having fevers. Now, what changes in their beliefs? A lot of things change. Their belief that you have just a standard fever grows up. Their belief that you probably have a wide array of other possible diseases, including but not limited to malaria, goes up a little bit. Because something is causing the fever, and it could be one of a lot of things, right? That's just a common immune response. Mm -hmm. So then the doctor's like, well, I want to learn, you know, can I figure out the causal aspects of why this person has a fever? So they'll start asking other questions where essentially they get new information that they can't observe. So the doctor can't directly observe if you have malaria. Well, I mean, I guess they could take a blood test. That's pretty much a direct observation. But before Mm -hmm. they do that, they'll ask you questions. Good one was, have you traveled recently? Now, what do you think if you you don't tell the doctor where you went, you just say yes? How does that affect the doctor's belief that you have malaria? Well, I think the odds of getting malaria are probably greater if you've traveled recently. Maybe not massively greater because maybe you traveled to the Arctic or you traveled to France where there's not that much malaria. But yeah, maybe you traveled to somewhere tropical and you were exposed. So as soon as they know you've traveled their belief goes up a little bit that it might be malaria. Probably not like doubling or anything. It's still unlikely, I I would imagine, but up a little bit. But also other conditions go up, right? Any other, you know, travel-related illnesses, you're likely to catch certain things when you travel more so than when you're at home. Let's take a break from our show today to talk about our sponsor, Periscope Data. Instead of telling you about some of the features of their product like I usually do, today I wanted to give you a little bit of a personal testimonial about the way I use Periscope Data. So there's a company I did some machine learning work for. So as every data scientist will tell you, garbage in, garbage out. If the data is no good, the models aren't going to work at all. So as is typical, I spent a lot of time building up the right filters, how to exclude things that for whatever reason didn't count and, you know, test accounts and all this kind of stuff. And I built up a view that really worked for me that I could power my model with. But of course, I was left with the nagging uncertainty that what if the underlying data shifts and that somehow screws up my model or causes drift in an unpredictable way? Well, I solved that with Periscope Data. I built myself a nice dashboard that tracks some of the key metrics and inputs that were going into my model. I set that to email myself every day so I could just keep an eye on the stats. I wanted to make sure that the summary statistic to describe the data set I cared about didn't shift. If you'd like to get your own custom-built dashboards in your email box at whatever frequency you want and also have the luxury of getting alerts that you design, you've got to check out Periscope Data. To get started, head over to periscopedata.com slash skeptics. So what do you think the doctor's next question would be after learning that you've been traveling? Where have you traveled? And where was the riskiest place you and I have ever traveled? I don't know if it's the riskiest, but one place we traveled a few years ago was Vietnam. Uh And they have higher cases, incidences of malaria than the U.S. In fact, we had to look at a map to see if we were in danger zones, right? Yeah, there are certain areas in Vietnam that are at higher risk for getting malaria. Um, So if then you report, oh, I just got back from Vietnam and I have a fever... Well, then I think the doctor's belief of the possibility of malaria, obviously they're not certain this could be a fever for any number of other reasons, but now it's a little bit suspicious, right? Suspicious that you might have malaria? Yeah. Well, because you traveled. If you had to throw out a random number, I know you're not a doctor or, or you don't work for the CDC or anything like that, but if you came back from Vietnam with a fever, what do you think are the odds it's malaria? I don't know. You could have had food 
just gotten sick from the food. Totally, yeah. So, I mean, I feel like there's at least that's a greater chance that you're just sick from yeah. food. Let's say malaria is 10% chance. You know, that's exactly what I was going to guess because as much as that's maybe alarmingly high that one out of 10 people are expected to have it and, you know, you definitely want to do whatever the follow-ups are, it's still not like a guarantee. It's still not the sky is falling. We can't panic. We have to think statistically. And the doctor actually has to make a judgment call, right? They have to decide what to do next. I don't know how you treat malaria. Yeah, I don't either. I guess the point I'm making here is that there's something about it that's external to the Bayesian network at this point. The doctor has to make a judgment call, but they make it informed by this Bayesian network, which represents the most up-to-date version of all the beliefs, the, you know, the culmination of knowledge they've acquired about you. And it does this in an efficient way. So what do you mean by efficient? The main thing I mean is that you can add new information and that new information can propagate throughout the whole network in a really quick way so you don't have to wait a long time. Given that and also some algorithmic details that I'm kind of skipping over here, because we don't represent the full probability, like everything related to everything, we only represent the probabilistic relationships between the things that matter, you know, like fever and travel matters, but fever and uh, your x-ray reading shouldn't relate to one another. Because those independences are captured in the network by the absence of a, an edge, we can better propagate the beliefs through the network in an efficient way. You can compute your updated beliefs given the new information in a short period of time. Well, the computer is doing the computing, right? Yeah. Okay. So you're saying for some various reasons, it's light and easy to update and doesn't take that long to compute. That's right. The hand wavy answer to why is because we're taking advantage of the statistical structure of the system. If people want more details, let me know in the comments. Maybe I'll do like a detailed blog post because I actually think it's an important result, but a little bit too deep maybe for the mini episode. Basically, we should walk away knowing that a Bayesian network is this. It's some kind of graph with nodes. That's right. Yeah. So each node is one random variable, one property you know about a system, and all the edges just describe the conditional dependencies. And as you'll recall, when we talked about last time, conditional independence, that property shows up in kind of a cool way here. If there's a conditional independence between two nodes, usually because you know something that you know is in between that relates them to one another, if you know the middle information, then receiving new information about either variable doesn't cause a, a belief update to happen across the rest of the network because, you know, if your smoke detector is going off, that's a good signal that your house is on fire. But if the fire department is actively there already, then the smoke detector doesn't tell you any new information. Mm -hmm. Bayesian networks, I like them because you can do statistical queries against the network. You can keep adding new information and then look and say, okay, well, given this new piece of information, how does that affect what I believe about some other related piece of information? So as a, a data structure that has an efficient way you can compute those things, you can have a really good probabilistic representation of whatever sort of system or project you're working on. Okay. Well, then just to round it up, I just wanted to clarify to our audience that we did not contract malaria. That's right. Just from in traveling. case that was an open question. And then secondly, our Prius does not have the check engine light on. So we are all good and safe. Yeah. How'd you turn that off? I didn't. I thought you did. No, I didn't. Now I'm a little worried. A long time ago, I thought you took it in to get an oil change, and that was it. All right, well, Lindy, what do you think is the most interesting part of this Bayesian Networks topic? There's a network. It makes decisions. It seems very binary. Oh, no, it's not binary at all. It's probabilistic. Well, I'm not really sure we discussed why it's probabilistic. Oh, let's get into that then. So every node has, I keep saying, a belief over it. That belief is a probability. So the, prob the likelihood that the check engine light is on, that's between zero and 100%. And I can go check it. And if I see it on or off, then I'll immediately like set the value, right? I'll say like, it's definitely off right now. I know that to be true because I trust my eyes. But if maybe I heard from you, as I did a moment ago, that it's off, and I'm not sure if I believe you, well, I just update my beliefs that I'm now like maybe 90% sure it's off. Because I, I think you might be right, but you're not a totally reliable source of information. No offense. So the question is not, is the light on? The question is, what's the probability that That's the light right. is on? Yeah. Okay, so 
just for our audience, then some of our questions should be rephrased. <laughs> yeah, I sometimes speak maybe a little bit too binary. Maybe that's what you mean. The variable itself, the node in the network might be light on or off. That's binary. But your belief, well, actually, we should say it's light on is the name of the node. And then your belief that that is true is the probabilistic part. Okay, so it's about your, what's the probability of X being whatever, likely or on or Exactly. Whatever. Okay. So my summary is now it's a probabilistic network. You got it. You nailed it on this one. Bayesian networks are really cool and very useful, maybe not as widely known or widely used as, you know, other things like just good old machine learning classification and deep learning and stuff like that. But I love Bayesian networks. I find them very useful. I've had the uh, pleasant opportunity to have deployed them on two occasions in my career. So that's pretty cool. Two occasions? Yep. Is that rare or is well. that often? Um, well, it seems a little rare. I've done other tasks more frequently. You know, like just I've done, I don't even know how many other machine learning models, tons, dozens at least. I've only deployed Bayesian networks twice. Is there an industry that it applies more to? Not necessarily an industry. I would say a class of problems, If I, at least that's the way I look at it. It's when knowledge representation is important. When you know a, you have a lot of different observable and unobservable variables, like maybe an industrial setting in some factory would be a good use case where you have measurements from the telemetry of all the different gauges and then certain things you can't measure. And you want to be able to ask questions about the state of the factory, not just like, is the factory going to experience a problem, which could be a fun prediction or classification problem, but you want to say, okay, if this gauge gets to this temperature, what do I think the pressure in this area will be? And you can run, you know, sort of statistical queries like that. Anyway, thank you as always for joining me, Lindy. Thank you. And until next time, I just want to remind everyone to keep thinking skeptically of and with data. Data Skeptic is a listener-supported program. To support the show, visit dataskeptic.com and click on the membership tab.